Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming. So today's event has been hosted by the Dubai Future Academy. If you haven't heard of us, we are based out of the Office of the Future, which is the first 3D printed building in the world, fully functional 3D printed building. You should definitely come visit us. We're just outside of Emirates Towers. So the Dubai Future Academy launched uh, this year in 2017, January. And we have launched two courses, which is the Future Design Diploma, which is um, led by Scott Smith which is going to be speaking to you today. And then we also have the executive education program, which is hosted by Think School of Creative Leadership. We will also be launching our masters um, in September, which will be in an applied masters in future sciences. And so we have an upcoming course uh, next week, which is going to be on the 14th. It's a one day mm -hmm. express course. So we generally run the two week course, which is the future design diploma. And then we have a a recap one day express course. We do the same for the exec ed, which is a four day course and then a one day recap. So the 14th um, course, which is coming up, is a one day recap of the future design. We've actually opened this one up to uh, public and private. So if you're a non Emirati, you can also apply this week. And uh, we hope to see you there next week. And without further ado, Jessica Bland. And thanks, Sarah. Sarah is one of our um, great research analysts at the Dubai Future Foundation, working particularly on the academy. Um, I'm head of research at the foundation, and one of my favorite bits of that job is working with experts, both academic experts and practitioners in foresight from around the world on our courses. It's really buggy. Um, and two of them who are in, week in, in Dubai this week um, are Scott Smith and Madeleine Ashby, and they're going to speak to us today about really about writing narratives, but narratives specifically about future worlds. This is what they help teach the students on the course. But today we're just going to have a discussion about what that means in their professional life and how they ended up doing this for a living. So <coughs> Madeline and Scott, please come up. Please come up. Um, we have incredibly high chairs, um, which is always funny when we have slightly shorter authors <laughs> on the panel. <laughs> well done. So. Telling stories about the future um, is really a subset of just telling good stories. And we've seen narratives change a lot in the 21st century. You know, we have, instead of just authors writing books, we now have fan fiction that often sells more copies than the original book itself. We have people writing stories together on the web. We have self-discovery stories on the web where you follow a journey that's different every time um, using the same kind of text. So. The subset of storytelling that we want to talk about is, is creating future worlds, how we use the present and we change some things about it, keep some things stable, to create a new world for different purposes, sometimes for the purpose of creating a new strategy for a company or for a government, um, and sometimes because it's really fun and we're going to sell books doing it. Um, and the people we have today do both of those things. And I guess what I'm interested to hear from them is how they ended up doing both of those things and, and how they interact, how you can both be a strategist and an author and you keep the quality in both at the same time. So I'm just going to start off by asking Madeline first to tell us a bit of history about herself, how she ended up being both um, a best-selling sci-fi author she thinks she's not best-selling, but Wikipedia says she is, so I'm going to go with that. Um, and um, a tutor in strategic foresight and innovation at OCAD University in Toronto. Th that's two halves of what she does. I um, hope she can explain how she got there. Madeline. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you for coming. Thank you for joining us. I really appreciate it. Uh, every author's worst nightmare is that you show up for the event and there's no one there. So thank you for allaying my fears another day. I really appreciate it. Thanks for being here. I know all of you are probably incredibly busy. And so thanks for taking the time. Um, so to answer that question, how did you, why do I do both? Like, why do I do all these things? It's a question, like, the better question, I think, would be, why don't I have a straight nine-to-five job? Um, I'm a freelancer. I do uh, adjunct. I teach at OCAD University. I teach at Ryerson. I, um, I have taught science fiction film. I teach in the Foresight Studio in the Strategic Foresight and Innovation Program at OCAD. I just this term wrapped up a course in creativity and collaboration at Ryerson University as well. Um, and then I'm also a science fiction writer. There are some of my latest novel, Company Town, is over there and, uh, and stuff. So if you're curious about you know, those books, they're over there. Um, how did I get to do this? Hmm. Um, 
Let me think about that. Uh, I had always wanted to be a writer. I had always been a storyteller. I used to wander around my room as a child, uh, sort of reciting stories to myself. I would make up funny voices and tell stories in funny voices. And you know, American healthcare being what it was, my parents probably just didn't have you know the money to take me to a doctor. So the um, so it, because of that, I got to actually develop a creative mindset. And um, and so th I was constantly making up stories. And then finally, at some point, they uh, they actually um, pitched in for a computer. And I started being able to, to, when I learned to type, I could finally start like typing out the things that were in my head. And I've been doing that ever since. Um, and uh, with moments of writer's block in between, of course. <laughs> um, so, uh, so I've always done that. And the reason I got into science fiction um, and stories about the future uh, I'd always been into those things. I was always like a Star Trek X-Files fan and a fangirl of those things, for sure. Largely due in part to my father. Um, uh, mom, mom is the, sort of the Jane Eyre side of the family and dad is the, you know, Dune side of the family. Um, and somehow they had me. And uh, they, uh, so I, I was into, I was into that and I, was always into stories about the future and always into stories about technology. And when I came to Canada in 2006, I joined a writer's workshop because I wanted to write a science fiction novel. I'd had a really transformative moment in my life where I met Ursula K. Le Guin in the basement of the Elliott Bay Book Company in Seattle, back when it was still actually on Elliott Bay and not on Capitol Hill. And she described science fiction as sort of a literature of change. You know, it often gets described as the literature of ideas. To me, like all literature is usually about ideas on some level, even if they're just bad ideas. Um, but this, she described it as, she described science fiction as being dangerous to those who profit from the way things are, because it proves that change is possible and it gives people ideas about change and ideas that things are not as secure as they think and ideas that, hey, maybe this isn't, go this, this could get better or it could get worse, things like that. So I was really f fascinated and inspired by that idea and I'd always sort of had these types of ideas for fiction but I realized that I could be doing more with it. And I decided then and there that this was the type of fiction that I wanted to try to do. And so when I moved to Canada in 2006, I graduated from Seattle University in 2005. I moved to Canada in 2006. And I, um, I went to, uh, you know, I couldn't work and I couldn't study. I could, didn't have a visa. I'm married into the country. And so I joined a, uh, a, a science fiction writers or a genre writers workshop, the Cecil Strait Irregulars, that was founded uh, 20, over, actually over 25 years ago um, and uh, at, a, at a library and sort of learned my craft there from people like Carl Schrader, Peter Watts. Uh, it's the same workshop that Cory Doctorow came out of as well. Um, and so it's, it was a chance to sort of hone my craft and hone the ideas and fix some bad habits and, and really learn you know, how, to, how to sit and write fiction and be alone doing fiction. The side of it that is about writing about the future and thinking about the future critically and being sort of a critical futurist, that's something else. Um, that takes almost more effort. Uh, that is about, um, that is tied directly to my education at OCAD. I have a uh, master's in strategic foresight and innovation, and now I teach in that program sometimes. Um, I learned sort of things about spotting signals, trends, and drivers, mapping two by two matrices. I sold a my, I sold my thesis to Intel Labs, which was on the future of border security. Um, it involved it involved short stories about the future of border security. Um, somehow I got to somehow I got to do this job, which is an amazing job, and I often say that it's the best job in the world. Um, but it's an, it involves sort of taking things that existing stimuli in the world. The way that science fiction works is you read sort of stories about technologies that are in development or science trends or, you know, you read science abstracts somewhere and you're like, huh, what if that were real? Like, what would that look like 20, 30, you know, 40 years down the road? Or sometimes if you're doing really far future science, science fiction, which by the way is far more successful. If you're trying to break into this job, for God's sake, write about spaceships and ray guns, like that is the way forward. What I do, the near future stuff that's incredibly depressing sometimes, like don't, that's not the, don't do it. 
don't be a hero. Like the, you know, like don't, don't do that. For sure include the spaceships and, and the post-humanity and like all that stuff. Like write your own language, do all those things. Make sure that you need a glossary at the front. They love that. Also maps, those are good. Like for God's sake, do that. My, you know, my little corner of, of science fiction is not necessarily what everybody is, is doing right now. Um, but it is a really fun way about talking about the future and it's sort of the only place that I have inspiration. So, um, so when we do that, when we're writing that sort of near future science fiction, you're looking at sort of stories that are in the news and you know, signals that are already floating around in the ether. And, and then you sort of think about what the, n the natural consequences are of those, or sometimes the, the absurd consequences of those. What is, the, what is the final, almost satirical end point of this trend? What will that mean? And you get sort of a taste in your mouth for, for what it's gonna feel like or what it could be like. And then you, if you, have the t if you have the time, you sort of write a story about it. Or you figure out ways that you can combine all of these different things into one cohesive whole. Now, you know, when I'm doing science fiction prototyping for companies, I do that based on a specific idea that they have about a technology that they are developing. So I have written stories for Intel Labs, the Institute for the Future, Sci uh, Futures, Nesta, Data and Society, the Atlantic Council, and others. Um, about things that they are working on and about they'll give me a brief or a PowerPoint or what have you about like, oh, we're working on this. What do you think this is going to look like when actual humans get their hands on it? Our engineers have been working on this for three years and now they're incredibly close to the problem. Can you get some distance on this, please? And I say, yeah, sure. The best question I get asked in my job is what's the worst that could happen? Um, it's my favorite question ever. Sometimes I get asked, what is the best thing that could happen here? I sometimes get asked, the, uh, what is the utopia, what is the utopian scenario here? Or what is the dystopian scenario here? And it always depends on, the answer to that always depends on who is asking me. It's like, if a car company is asking me what the utopian scenario is for them, like, oh, it's a thing where people still gr drive cars. Um, which, depending on where you are in the world, might be more or less likely. So there's, it's context dependent. And, and so on. So it always depends on who's asking the question. And so I, I focus a lot on sort of, you know, okay, well, where are we? Who, you know, the, the usual five W's, who, what, where, when, why, how, all that stuff. Um, those are just as important in fiction as they are in journalism or, or, any, th or any other form of research. Um, hmm. I don't know if that answers your question, though. <laughs> It does to some extent. It'd be really good. I don't, some of your examples, I know you can't talk about. If you're, <laughs> it, if you're thinking about the future transport for a, for a car company, I can see why they keep that quiet. But I wondered, there is one example you could mention that kind of brings to life what you've just been describing. Oh, yeah. So um, there are some things that I do that are sort of freely available out in the universe. Uh, so for example, for Data and Society, which is a think tank based out of uh, New York, they asked for a future of smart cities. They're, they were doing a project on um, the future of, uh, of intelligent systems, and I said, well, I can do a smart cities story about disaster relief. And so I did, you know, this story about people driving in after an ice storm and, like, what ice storms do to smart city systems and how you coordinate aid and things like that. For the Institute for the Future, they were doing a project called the Future of Networked Matter, and I was part of a, an anthology with me, Cory Doctorow, Warren Ellis, uh, Ramez Nam, um, and uh, uh, Rudy Rucker, and we coincidentally all wrote incredibly sort of creepy stories about your your smart city homes or your smart home slowly becoming alive because it was about it was about the level of the matter being intelligent and stuff so it's it was a really great anthology to be part of I've also been part of sort of anthologies that live in the middle of that I'm part of project hieroglyph um, which is based out of uh, AS Arizona State University that was uh, and uh, Harper Collins that was edited by Katherine Kramer and Ed Finn at ASU and that was sort of an optimistic science fiction anthology about you know inspired by a Neil, Neil Stevenson talk about the need for big projects or what have you or big you know um, you know big ideas and I ended up that uh, came out in two 2013 I think and or 2014 and I ended up writing a story about uh, a southern uh, a border city in the southern United States on the border between the United States and Mexico, where instead of, for example, a wall, uh, there was a border town, a town where you could sort of, where your, your citizenship may in fact be gamified and people could be judging you, much like the prisoner, and, uh, and sort of talking, you know, 
deciding whether or not they wanted people in, in the community. And I sort of said to Catherine, like, I'm not sure that this is the most optimistic scenario. And she, she's like, no, we want, we want sort of the balance between the bitter and the sweet. And we also want things that are not just about, you know, a big wall. Um, so I think like there's a lot of room when you, there's a lot of room and a lot of give and take in those when you're talking about sort of a thing that is optimistic or a thing that is pessimistic. What you know, even science fiction has to be true to life. Um, it doesn't. It's not an excuse for bad character development. It's not an excuse for a plot that doesn't make sense. Although plot is the last thing I should be judged on, um, and the last thing I should critique in others sometimes. But uh, you know, it's no excuse for bad habits in in depicting uh, reality, even if that reality is a future reality. Um, so yeah, it's it's sort of the, those are the types of things that I end up working on, and then it and then I get to come here <laughs> and teach other people about how to do that for themselves, and that's sort of almost more. It's rewarding in a very different way, but rewarding, but but equally rewarding because it's about helping people come up with their own ideas. You know, I can come in with my ideas about like, oh, the future of this is is the future of X is Y, or the future of you know the future of this industry is from my perspective this. But when you're with students, you are encouraging them to generate their own ideas based on their own research and their their sort of own perspective that is local and 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 informed by a context that I might be less familiar with, and sort of see, grabbing those ideas rather than barging in and saying, well, this is how it's going to be. Da, 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 da. Um, What's really important to me is sort of hearing those ideas and letting them come come to fruition and seeing, you know, the that other perspective. Thank you, um, Scott. I have a similar question for you, but I, I I thought it would be helpful. So Scott runs an agency called Changeist um, and has many fifteen plus twenty plus years of experience. Um, all right, all right, longer. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't look it. <laughs> um, um, doing foresight professionally, and and so I guess it'd be good to get a sense from you how you link the two together, how you move from a structured foresight process and maybe what that is um, into narrative. So yeah, I mean I, I have a I guess a, a slightly different background of coming from uh, and actually when I was younger, when I was a teenager, I was a writer. I wanted to be a fiction writer. I wanted to be Madeline when I was younger. I just hadn't met her yet. Um, but I wanted to, to sort of write stories and, and, you know, tell creative stories about the world. And, you know, you do the responsible thing, you go to university. I came out having studied languages and culture and anthropology and business and went into kind of a role as a traditional business consultant, a business writer. I was basically covering business markets um, in other countries and helping people in this country understand what's happening in that country in terms of business dynamics. And I st accidentally stumbled into the beginning of the web and the internet, uh, st literally standing in the right office at the right time in 1993, um, and was pulled into a, a very um, interesting job trying to describe the emergence of this thing that hasn't been there yet. We didn't have an internet. We didn't really know what it could do, what the possibilities were, how it would change people's lives. But there was a traditional practice of forecasting, particularly quantitative forecasting, you know, where you're building a model that says, in this five-year period, we will grow this many subscribers or users or revenue, um, which is an awkward place to stand between highly structured tools and a highly ambiguous, very, very fuzzy and quite unknown potential future. Um, and having done that for 10 years, uh, I finally sort of stepped back from it and said, you know, I, I I'm trying to make sense of the world, but I'm doing it with tools that are slightly uncomfortable for me. I'm, being, I'm using too much structure. Um, and found myself in the world of strategic foresight, which is roughly defined as um, a sufficiently structured means of developing a high quality view of possible futures. Uh, it's a way of, of creating and uh, using enough structure that you can take all of the diverse signals about the world out there right now, the things that are, that are early indicators of potential pathways of the future, and assembling those in different ways using enough synthesis and enough methodology that people are comfortable. Uh, you're not just pulling predictions out of the air, but you are structuring forecasts and structuring scenarios. But you're actually, the critical piece is to be able to tell a story that's rich enough about that data and those insights that you can invite people into that world. And effectively, that's what we do now. That's what we teach at the academy in the future design class. 
and that's what we do as a practice, and it's actually how we've come together. Yeah. We came from, a, from mixed backgrounds, actually met uh, at OCAD mm -hmm. when Madeline was doing her master's in strategic foresight, and I was brought there by an anthropologist um, who was, we were working on ways to explore the merger between ethnography and anthropology, telling stories about cultures and um, the tools of futures and foresight. So in a weird way, it's been 25 years of sense making and learning how to tell stories that are useful enough to engage people, to bring them into that and not just have them come to you and say, make a prediction, imagine a future for me and here's, you know, we'll, we'll pay you, hopefully. Um, but it's about, about um, bringing them along in their own realization, their own sense making, their own understanding of the world and how it might unfold. And a, you know, a critical piece of that is understanding what stories organizations tell each other or tell themselves, what stories do brands tell themselves, what stories do governments tell their citizens, what stories do cultures tell themselves about who they are, where they think they're going, what progress looks like, what is utopia, what is dystopia. And so a lot of what we've found ourselves doing in the past five years or so is, is acquiring and finding ways to use more and more and more diverse storytelling tools um, that can engage people in the appropriate way. Uh, it's not one size fits all, everything is a short story. Um, but we use material design, we use narrative, we use media, we use familiar forms of storytelling. And sometimes we really experiment and find completely new ways of doing things to ultimately reach that goal of helping people understand a clearer pathway forward, whatever that's going to be. Yeah, I'm, I'm particularly intrigued to see this kind of emergence of design fiction, so mm. where we see very high quality design skills combined with good narrative, um, not just in, on the stage or in the art gallery now, but actually in the way that people launch products mm -hmm. um, or the way that new policies are announced by government sometimes. Um, Scott, I wanted to, in fact, probably to both of you, but I'm assuming with that many years of experience, you have more stories of this. Like, what's the worst kind of client you can get in this area? I mean, sometimes I think, mm. like, so you just walk into a room and someone says, here's my new product, tell me a story about it. What's, th what's the kind of worst constraint someone can put on this kind of creative work? I think this is true now, and it was true even when I was doing forecasting, like quantitative forecasting. The, 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 the people that are least helpful to work with, that's a nice way of putting it, are the ones who come with the story in a box and they want you to tell it for them. Or they want you to basically be the mouthpiece for it. Um, so they have, a f they have a determined future. They basically have already chosen what they want it to be. Um, and they are basically trying to put that future into the world and can bend other people towards it. So it's acting as their instrument, <laughs> acting as their mouthpiece, instead of helping them explore multiple possible futures and then determine which is the best way forward and how to tell that story. So it's the ones who show up and basically say, you're a futurist, do a future for me, is, is, is frankly the, the, the ones that are the least fun to work with. Okay, Amanda, do you have an answer to the same question? Yeah, I think it's I think it's actually very much the same. There's definitely the when when people say tell our future for us, it's like or you know, give us give us your vision of this future that we have predetermined. It's like hire an ad agency for that. That's a Stratcom's problem. That's not my problem. You know, there are lots of many there are many good ad agencies out there that would love to help you with this issue. Um, there are people who I think any time the wor I think the worst question is what is the future of? What is the future, the singular future? What is the future? Because that assumes predeterminism. It assumes that the future is somehow foreordained and I'm the one who's telling it to you, that I'm somehow divining something from beyond and telling you like what, how, this is how it's gonna be. I've looked into the crystal ball and I've, to I've told you like, no, that's not it. Um, I, am hel I am introducing you to many possibilities here. Ideally, I help you find the possibility that works for you and then you work backward to find a way there. Um, I give you a, a place on a map and say, hey, you might be here. You might try to get here. You need to then make the strategic decisions to get, you to, to get over there, to reach that place. 
and, and stuff. So I always sort of caution people when they ask, what is the future of? And it's often why even something like the future of network matter or the future of intelligent systems, like anthology projects that I've worked on have never been just me. They've always involved multiple authors. They've always involved multiple perspectives. Um, because, and even sometimes when I've been given a technology that's in development, I've been asked to write sort of a four quadrant you know, or a, a quadrant system of different types of stories of here are some different ways that this could go. Um, because there is no one future for any of us. There is no one future for, for any particular technology. Even people who use the same technology use it in different ways based on sort of usage patterns, desire, demography, locality, things like that. You always think the the five worst words you can hear are the in the future you will in the future you will because yeah. that essentially is kind of taking your agency away and saying here's ex you know here's how it's going to be here's exactly what's going to happen, boom and you need to fit into that. No, yeah, as because to exploring the, the the possibilities as a means of identifying what are the sensitivities, where what do you need, what do you not have, what are you afraid of, what do you do well, where are you, where are the benefits, where are the opportunities. There's a lot of ex exploration that that sentence closes down or that phrase closes down. Yeah, because there, I often liken this job to some level of corporate therapy where I go in and say like, okay, well, what is making you anxious about the future? What are you hopeful for? What are you afraid of? Why did you, why did you ask me to come here? It's like gross point blank. If, you, if I show up at your door, it's because you brought me there. The, um, the uh, if, you know, there's a conversation to be had about what's next but we have to talk about why you might be anxious about it or what you're hoping will be next and, and so on. And you have to be really comfortable with ambiguity. And if you're not comfortable with that ambiguity and you're not willing to admit that something might go wrong or that something might go really right, both of those are harmful narratives, right? Like, everything is terrible, nothing can change. That to me is the, is the most dangerous idea. The most dangerous idea in the world is that nothing will change and that everything will remain the same. But where you are on fortune's wheel can really make a big difference there. Either way, it's still turning. Um, and I, have, I guess I have one last question before um, asking from our audience. Um, I just should warn you first that we're recording this for Facebook. Um, so if you don't want your name to be mentioned on Facebook, tell me afterwards and we'll remove that bit of it. Um, but my last question is actually when you sit down to write, um, so I'm quite used to writing like briefing reports or strategy documents, and I can sit in an office here and do that. But the creative process of writing a story is, is quite distinct from that. I, um, do you go about it the same way as when you're sitting and writing an email in the office? Do you have particular tricks or ways of mind frames you need to get yourself in for, for, for really creating that world as opposed to, I don't know, writing three bullet points for next, next week's to-do list? Well, three bullet points for next week's to-do list could also be speculative fiction. Yes, it's true. If we're honest. It's true. Yeah. Um, I think, and, and so that's, <laughs> that's a separate thread, but, <laughs> <clears throat> but it's an important one because there are so many different forms that speculation can take, and thankfully today there's a lot of different forms that people are exploring that are incredibly familiar to us, like bug reports, or Facebook pages, or YouTube comments. We were talking earlier about this area called design fiction, which mm -hmm. is trying to, cr to create a window into a future that, that feels like it's today and now. Um, there's a lot of different um, forms of m communication and writing that can take, but I also think it's being able to um, being able to hold the different possible points in your head while having the kind of creative flow that comes from being a writer and and embedding solid structure into um, an engaging narrative into mm -hmm. telling a story about the future of a company or the future of a market or the future of you know, part of our ecosystem or a device in a way that, that draws people into that story. Because stories are a familiar vehicle. Storytelling is a familiar vehicle, but you can, you can put bits of reality or hard information into that. You probably have a different approach because you're more writer and, than I am. <laughs> you're uh, more of a writer than I am. Uh, uh, not, well, we'll see. Um, the, uh, 
I think, yeah, I mean, I focus less on design fiction because I'm more of a prose writer, for sure. But I encourage my students into design fiction because the asking someone to sit alone at a desk um, and, and pound out sort of fiction for, for hours is not necessarily the best thing to ask people to do. And it doesn't necessarily leverage all their talents. The thing about design fiction is that it leverages existing talents in people who, who may have design skills, who may have branding skills, who may have those communication skills, who may have an artistic, like a different type of artistic background background that suddenly like when you get those when you get those talents in play with a speculation about the future suddenly you can get this really finished product or this really interesting commentary that takes the that takes uh, that becomes an artifact from a future, that becomes sort of its own physical engagement, that engages the whole body in dealing with something in a way that prose sometimes doesn't um, or, or might not. Um, and so I guess for me, the thing writing, writing fiction or writing a story, often people ask me to write stories because they're a really easily transmissible um, piece, of, piece of kit. They're a really easily transmissible tool. They're our oldest technology in a lot of ways. Even, even the most abstract information uh, was once a story. Even the most abstract myth pre in pre-literate times was once a story. Even you know, myths, fables, legends, all that, all that type of stuff was a story um, at one point. And it was a story about this is why the rain falls, or this, is, or this is why you shouldn't go over to this place, or this is why things are the way that they are. Um, those are all, all stories, and they're all they all relay information in a way that is easy to understand, comprehensible, compelling, memorable, and, and, crea and helps create a culture and helps create an identity. Um, so I think that, you know, when I'm sitting down to write a story, I think the, one of the reasons that, that I get asked to do that is because it also, it's easy to transport and easier sometimes to read than a full report or a series of pie charts or a series of, um, or a series of facts or, or you know, easy, easier to absorb sometimes even than a PowerPoint. Um, I once was given the task of writing a story based on like a, a huge brief that had a ton of foresight information in it. It was like a beautifully well-researched report. And all of the trends were there. All of the information was there. All of the, these beautiful graphics were there. And it was 150 pages of beautiful material. And I said, I got back to them and I said, like, I'm flattered that you are asking me to do this, but really it seems like you've done all the work here. Like, I, I can see your signals, trends, and drivers. I can see all your critical uncertainties. I can see all of, you've done all of it. Why do you need me? And, and they said, well, we want the board to be able to read it on the plane. It has to be this big and fit on a phone. And that's, that's a story, that's a piece of short fiction, not a big, huge binder full of stuff. And then I said, oh, okay. Um, so often I feel like I'm writing into those little spaces sometimes, sometimes this big, because you, want, you still want your audience to sort of take something away. Like the, the question that I got asked, by students a lot is like, well, what should we do? What should, how should we make this? What should, we, what should we do? Which is the right element to create? And I say, well, okay, uh, what do you want people to know? What are you trying to say? And that's whether I'm writing a novel or writing a short story or what have you, or even designing, you know, some sort of experience. If I'm doing, even if I, I even if I'm writing some sort of script or something like that, I say, what are we trying to say here? What are we trying to get across? What do we want to leave people with? And those are questions of art across a bunch of different disciplines, but they're in many ways the most important questions. So it's sort of what, I, it's sort of what I'm focusing on when I'm able to focus. I mean, you're asking a writer about how they write, which is like, that's like, uh, asking a writer about how they write is like asking a, um, a painter how they dance or something like that. It's sort of, it's really, really difficult to sort of drill into your own process while you're experiencing it. Um, I guess the difference between writing all the, the, you know, writing the emails or writing, getting the business side done of the writing is like its whole other thing. They each become procrastinations for each other, I guess. <laughs> that sounds actually really familiar. Yeah, <laughs> like I think that might be just endemic to the human condition, no matter what job you have. You, it, it, it all just turns into a shell game of like procrastinating on one task to get something else done. And it's like, the, the joke among a lot of my novelist friends is, well, I have a deadline on Monday, so my house has never been cleaner. And I think that, that works for government employees. Yes. <laughs> um, did, did anyone have a question? There's, there's one at the back. Anyone while I'm going through? Okay, I'll take one here and then come through to you. Yes. 
Uh, so my name is uh, Tiberio. Thank you very much for, for sharing all this with us. Um, I wanted to ask you, uh, because you already got a question about the, the, the worst uh, type of clients, I wanted to ask you about the, the good types of clients. Um, f from what I'm understanding from, from you is that uh, more and more there are people uh, within institutions, within governments that are uh, keen to, to test this. Uh, is it more about... Uh, people within institutions that have a certain personality to, to, to come to you and say, we want to test an utopian and a dystopian uh, future for our government plan? Or is it about institutions themselves that are becoming more keen to, uh, to test this, uh, this type of services? I think um, the, the nice thing that's beginning to happen is that there's a realization that traditional methods of trying to determine uh, what's going to happen next or what, what sort of best strategic approach fits for a government or an organization, in some ways we're seeing those break down because a lot of the stories they're dependent on are breaking down as well. Um, so there's a, a greater outreach. I mean, this is a fabulous example here in Dubai. There are other governments that are doing similar things but probably not well as well advanced and actually trying to develop the muscle, the capacity, and the skill for a really wide array of people across the government, across the organization, to have um, a viable set of future skills. So they're not coming to you necessarily as much with a singular question about, you know, help us understand the future of um, forests or the future of, you know, the UK post-Brexit or the future of money. As much as they're beginning to come and say, we need as many people as possible to be equipped to help us answer those questions ourselves. And I think that's a critical shift because they're, they're recognizing that one, this is a skill that isn't, it, requ it requires a certain kind of level of, of uh, or certain kinds of thinking, but it's not something that everyone can't do. So it's teachable to a wide array of people. Um, it's also something that can be threaded into other processes and other ways of thinking within organizations. So it's no longer really the case of coming and just hiring the specialist putting them in a room, getting all of the secrets out of them, and then having them, you know, printing a report. It's propagating the ability to do what we do across a much broader population because the risks are growing, um, the timescales are growing short, things like climate change, migration, um, the, the future of work. You know, you go across the board topically, all of those issues are reaching critical breaking points that governments realize they can't use traditional approaches for. So they need as many people as possible equipped to assess those issues and come up with their own strategic thinking about it rather than relying on the bottleneck of singular experts. And so I think that's been a really, a really beneficial shift um, that's, that's it's, it's happening slowly, but you can begin to see it change over time. I would, I would agree. I think like I think that the trend that we've seen uh, among governments and organizations that are participating in this type of thinking is that they want to engineer in a degree of resiliency and creativity and nimbleness. And they want to encourage people to sort of voice their concerns before their concerns become a legitimate problem. Um, they want to see, they want to hear about that, but they need sort of a structured way to do it. And that's sort of what a workshop is. That's, that can become, you know, a foresight workshop that, that we facilitate. That can become sort of an, an away day or a series of activities that, that help people sort of grapple with tensions that they already know are existing or with research that, that an outside agency like us, like we have already done. So, um, so I think that that's sort of one of the things that, that people are gravitating towards is that they know that after the internet, um, things are different. And they know that, that with the speed of communication that is available now, things are different. And that people are communicating about their government in a very different way and talking about issues in a very different way. Because also, what has also happened in, in the internet is that more people are getting, getting educated, more women are being educated, the standard of living is rising across the, across the world. More people are able to participate in their democracy than ever before sometimes. And so it's like, I think that when governments come to us, they sort of are asking for um, how, how to deal with that and how to, how to, um, how to approach people on, on a level and get how, how they can become sort of participants as well. Like it's a way to shake things up. Um, and so that's sort of one of the, that's one of the best things about it actually. <laughs> 
Sorry, my name is Damu Winston. I'm the founder of uh, Universal Linguistics. My question is more focused on, the, I guess, the practicality of certain things. So it sounds like you guys do like scenario planning and yep. you develop some narr narratives from that. My question is really along the lines of how do you create dashboards? I think you talked about it to Madeline. You talked hmm. about earlier creating some kind of report that's like on, a, on one page. When I work with clients, that's yeah. the one thing they care about is that one page document. So what are the tools that you guys are, cr are using to create those one pagers? Oh. Wait, you mean, are you asking me if I write it in Scrivener or Word, or are you asking me if I, you know, what, like, you know, what the final finished product looks like? Well, I assume that you create kind of a report, and then you also have kind of a, maybe a one page or a quick fact sheet, or some kind of diagram, infograph, something that kind of gives people the, here are some of my drivers, here are the risks, here are your, your opportunities, and you kind of say, here are your four quadrants, something yeah. like that. You know, what, what do you, do you have something like that? If not... I'm just trying to learn some new tools, that's all. Hmm. So one of, the, one of the ways that I would look hmm. at that is that, you know, you, you ask organizations up front when you're dealing with someone, like how do you, you try to kind of assess how they assess the problem. How do they understand things like, how do they measure risk? What's critical to them? Is time frame important? Do you need to know how near, how far this thing is? This object is closer than it appears. Um, so uh, levels of probability, and not in a quantitative sense, but being able to sort the things that we, have a high confidence are going to happen from things that are out there, but we're not quite sure where they sit. Thing, you know, being able to, to box things out by time, um, possibility, uh, maturity. Similar metrics you might think about in some ways with you know, investment management. You're thinking about like, where is this on the curve? And, and identifying those in a loose enough sense that it doesn't get people over obsessed with the quantitative measure because we're not talking quantitative here. You may do quantitative modeling after the fact. But what you're really talking about is trying to give people a sense of one of the reasons people don't want to engage in the, in the future is that they see it as this swarm of issues and they can't sort one from the other. Starting to sort of get a sense of distance, impact, scope, all of those kind of basic questions, level of maturity, is this new, is it old, is it growing, is it shrinking? And identifying those in a way that people can at a glance start to see how different one issue is from the other. If I'm, if I'm understanding you, that, that's one way of doing it, is being able to kind of use visual tools, use narrative tools to give a, a short description of how this issue and this issue and this issue, so want to engage them to actually go deeper into those topics and understand them sufficiently. Not necessarily to become a domain expert, but to have a, a working knowledge of the issue so they can understand how they function together. Thank you. Um, did anyone else have questions in the... Yeah, okay. I'm going to go to the back first this time. <laughs> <laughs> also, ladies first. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, actually, I want to ask, I want to know the difference between uh, the future uh, story and uh, the future scenarios. Is there is difference between them or both of them are same? The other uh, question is regarding the future stories. Uh, at, at which level of the organization? It, it is at process level, at departmental level, of, of, or overall uh, organization level, strategic level? Hmm. Oh, uh, so when I, write a, when I write a science fiction story for a company, or when I'm writing a story, or, or an organization, or a government, uh, or versus when I'm writing a, a science fiction story just for me, I guess, for my own enjoyment and my publisher's enjoyment, um, and the reader's enjoyment. Um, that is tough. Uh, I sort of work for, I, I, I am doing the job based on the brief that I am sent. So sometimes I'm, you know, asked by, I'm asked to write a story that's for, just for, just to be read by a board of trustees. Like, here's the board of trustees, your, your story is going to six different people and that's it. Sometimes it's going to be released publicly. It really depends on the engagement. It, you know, it's, it's sad to answer a question with it depends, but it can go anywhere. Uh, depending on the people who are asking me to, to write it. It might be, once I, um, I actually, my favorite story about this job is that uh, I wrote a suite of stories and my client took those stories and presented them elsewhere, um, outside, of, outside of the country. And uh, one of the stories made someone so angry that they got up and left and then came back the next day and led a counter presentation. They're like, she is wrong and this is why, and, <laughs> and did this, this whole thing. And, but it generated a huge amount of conversation. 
it generated a huge amount of ideas because there was that disagreement. So I, I like that too. I think that that's, that's, when, that's what we're using, that's what art should always be about. And, and so to create that conversation. So that's sort of, you know, it can kind of go anywhere depending on, on the eventual audience. When I'm writing something that's just for me or just for my publisher and I, or, or a short story that I'm gonna submit to a magazine or something like that, then I get to go even, uh, then the sky is sort of the limit. I can write about whatever it is that I wanna write about, uh, whether it's, you know, self-replicating robots or the future of oil rigs or who knows what. Um, I can sort of get into a bunch of different topics and, and and go even weirder or or crazier or darker or what have you, um, because there isn't there aren't those limitations. There are sometimes that I really relish having the limitations that are put on me by an assignment, um, because it really forces me to really think carefully about how to do this. And there are other times where it's like, oh great, I can cut loose and and do it, you know, my way. So. And I think different levels of organizations need to tell different kinds of stories or, or they're, they're useful for telling different kinds of stories. So certain levels of kind of big stories, almost myths, large scale stories work um, at, the, at the kind of high level in an organization. They're there to kind of project a vision to tell the big story about where we are going. As you kind of move down into an organization, often, what, at least what I found, and I think this is probably the case with you as well, is that you can tell more detailed stories with more landscape within different work groups. So if it's a design team working on a project, they are familiar with and understand a lot more about the user's lives or the customer's lives or the citizen's lives and they want more detail. They really need that detail to, to design to or to, to create strategy for. Higher level in an organization, they're often looking for something that's a bit more panoramic and, and broad, I guess, at a kind of cultural yeah. level. Yeah. That's not strictly, I mean, it's a generalization, but I think that tends to be the difference. The, the term scenario was actually appropriated by an early sort of futurist in the 1950s and 60s, Herman Kahn, from the film industry because he was sitting at the Rand Corporation in Southern California right next to Hollywood. So the people who were doing Cold War strategy uh, for the government were, you know, out at night with the people who were writing screenplays for films, and they realized that there was you know, that th they could basically pick that recipe up and move it over. So scenario came from film into futures, and now it means a lot of things. It means use cases, it means big stories, or it can also mean a McKinsey two by two, you know, grid and a report. Um, the, there's, a, there's much more softness now, I think, between them, it's not as, not as rigid a sort of distinction. But it's knowing also kind of what's the best way to tell a story for a particular um, mm -hmm. question. Mm -hmm. It may not even be a, a, a prose story. It might be a set of objects. This is what we're doing here. It's, it's sometimes a product or um, a, a series of photos or architecture. The way this room is designed tells a particular story about where Dubai wants to go. Yeah. The aesthetics of it, the messages, the, the entryways, all of this tells stories. So we're able to find different new ways to actually combine these methods to, to make the point or to engage people in, or to move them in the, in the direction we want to go. Hi. Hello. I'm Allison. I had no idea this job existed, so thank you for sharing. You guys are like fortune tellers. Someone gives you data and you imagine the future. Mm. That, that's my <laughs> simplified version, but very, very cool. So what I'd like to ask you with, with, with taking my very basic understanding of what you do now forward is, how can we apply what you're doing, or have you yet applied what you're doing in an educational context? For example, in a primary school, let's say there's a new education technology that's gonna disrupt how children learn. Um, you would need a specific skill set of developmental psychology, educational theory, pedagogy, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Have you done it? Has it worked? Uh, is there a case in point you can explain? My first time teaching eight years ago, teaching this topic was actually to gifted high school students at a program in the US at Duke University. So you're working with 14 to 16 year olds, essentially finding ways to make what's graduate level yeah. curriculum appropriate and structured for that age group, their experience in the world, their level of context, but also a high skill level with tools. Um, and that's a particular challenge. In some cases, we've actually worked with schools. We've worked with um, and primary and secondary schools to help the faculty and the organization itself 
figure out what its pathways forward were given the things that would change in the community, the things that would change in technology, the things that would change with the students. Each time you're, you're structuring this in a way that you, for teaching it to other people or helping them find a way, you should be um, structuring it using familiar methods and familiar metaphors and you know, leveraging the strengths of that group. Um, I've had some opportunity to work with younger students and in some ways you're, you're, you're just working with larger objects, bigger ideas, you know, less fine tuning, you're not making them use you know, business school methodologies. But you're also, what you're trying to do is to help them tell a story, help them explore different stories about what's happening. In some ways what's happening at that level is not radically different under the bonnet than what's happening you know, at a sophisticated corporate level. You're uncovering sensitivities, interests, desires, fears, and helping them structure that into a story that tells other people where they want to go. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm trying to think if there's, uh, if, if you sort of look into sort of foresight projects around the future of education, you will probably find them. It's hard for me to believe that there haven't been, a, been any. I, in fact, I think the opposite is true. Um, I know that one of, my, um, one of my cohort at OCAD University did a project on the future of education. Her name is Janet Jones. Um, and sort of, we can apply a lot of different methodologies towards thinking about that. In terms of, if I were like doing a study on that, what I would need, or if I were asked to write up a report on that, I would need sort of trends in education. I would need to do the research. I would need to, to look at, and I would also need to know the locality. What is the local history of this particular organization? What is the context here? Um, um, the worst thing that can happen sometimes is when I walk into a job and they haven't told me everything. Um, it feels like that, yes. Um, and uh, and if, they ha if there are certain elements that have been left out of the narrative, for example, <laughs> um, then it's much harder to be effective, right? So sometimes a lot of this, and anyone who has done a long-term consultation with anybody knows this, that like the deeper you dig, some of it is like being a private detective within an organization. It's like, oh right, there's, here's the office bully. Here's the, here's, here's the decisions that got made three years ago that changed everything. Here are the things. And in order to know what might happen, you have to know what did happen. Um, I started out, uh, I went to a tiny Jesuit university in, in Seattle, Washington, uh, that uh, I, I was a, an honor student there and focusing on the classics and I, w I started out as a history major and it led me to futures work because it taught me to think about material culture, artifacts, anthropology, storytelling, narrative, culture, all those different things which are equally as relevant when you're speculating or, or imagining or, or, um, or something about the future of a given context. Yeah, I think um, in education in Europe recently, there was quite a lot of work done um, in collaboration with Pearson on how yeah. education technology is changing the classroom. Um, but what's tricky is the classroom around the world, despite those education technologies being similar, there are iPads in most classrooms now, <laughs> um, actually how people learn in those contexts is remarkably different. And so the localizing of that work still needs a bit of effort. By yeah, some well, no, and, and as someone who just, I was responsible for about 120 students last term in different classes, and I will tell you that each of them are very different. And they all have different needs, and approaching them, you know, through, through the same very banal piece of software is only going to help them so much. <laughs> I think we have the last question. Question, with the last question. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Krishan from Proversity, one of the startups based here at Dubai Future Accelerator. Um, first of all, thank you. That was really fascinating to hear the discourse and the differences between uh, actually what you guys do. And actually one of the things I've noticed is the difference between design fiction and design fact is getting awfully a lot closer. We can visualize concepts and actually build and test, actually not even need to build them anymore. We can test them virtually. We can 3D print things, uh, a lot of the building outside, for example. Um, so I'm curious what you think is the future of telling stories about the future, <laughs> given that we can actually almost potentially design and build things off the fly from what you can conceive. It's a really tricky area right now because we've <laughs> we're experiencing a real sudden convergence or rapid convergence of just what you've pointed out the ability to to manufacture a story at scale in a space in a situation is becoming simpler um, and uh, and kind of telling what's yeah what's what's an artifact to tell a story is you know how do you tell that from a demo of a product 
I often would tell people, you know, my 20 years ago I was getting startup decks, kind of in the early days of the internet, from people who were trying to raise money. A pitch deck from a startup is a design fiction until it's funded and running and making money. I mean, it's effectively a promise, a story you're trying to convince other people about a particular future. Um, so the, the ground between the sort of the, the two areas is quite slippery, but it also raises interesting ethical issues of what is a demo, what is a promise, what is real, and what's what's there for the purpose of critique. Uh, we have this issue, we, we, this comes up immediately when you start looking at, at um, fictional scenarios about near medical breakthroughs or medical technologies. Is this something that could actually be possible? What are you doing to people? What, what, you know, what, what, are you, what strings are you pulling when you're opening up the possibility of someone's life being better who's you know, currently ill or suffering or has family members? So those ethical areas really need to be kind of colored in in finer detail now, and that's part of the experimentation we end up doing is kind of finding out exactly what that's like. I know the, in the Museum of the Future at the World Government Summit the last few years, there's been those sorts of situations where people approach something assuming that it's real, and it's really a representation of a possible future. You have to have a conversation with them saying, yes, but this is here for the sake of discussion. You can't take it. Yeah, I think that there's a thing that happens where it's really e it's it's much easier now to sort of proto prototype an object or prototype a platform or a service than it ever used to be. That is also rapidly moving along, so that it, something can go from ideation or idea to ideation to prototype to device to what have you really fast. Um, two days. Two downstairs days. Two right days now. downstairs right now. Um, making something, but what? where you run into, where you have to sort of slow down and think harder is the distance between designing something that is beautiful and, desi and designing something that is useful to a wider array of people. Um, it's one thing to design a beautiful building, but if it's all made of stairs, then no one in a wheelchair can use it. Um, it's one thing to design, it's one thing to design the Apple Watch with, with health kit in it, but if it can't track menstruation, then, you know, women who are trying to get pregnant can't use it. You know, if, uh, if there are, um, if you aren't including, you know, if you aren't making those spaces, if you aren't sort of thinking things through, then you are, then you're, then all you are left with is a beautiful object. And like the last thought about that is that we should be telling stories with, not telling stories at. Yes. Yeah. And I yeah. think that's, that's where the kind of the, the critical futures piece comes back into play and in that we are often trying very hard and, and not to not come in and say, here's what we think your story should be, but engaging, engaging groups or people, individuals, companies, whatever, to, tell, to, to help them tell the story that's theirs. Um, we're starting to think about a project called The Future From that's mm -hmm. effectively looking at different parts of the world and understanding what does the future look like from here? I may have a perception coming in from the outside, but, but I promise you it's, a, it's full of people who have different perceptions and desires and wants and pathways that are their own. So how do we, how do we enable them to tell the story and tell the story with them, not at them or for them? Um, with that in mind, I'm going to ask you to, no. Um, <laughs> oh boy. So with that in mind, I guess my very final question to each of you is that if you were to do a project right now in this second, it might change in 15 seconds time, and um, with a group about a specific subject, what might it be? And I was going to say in Dubai, but it doesn't have to be in oh, Dubai. I we like being here. We love, I love being here. But, but maybe, um, so I think particularly, for example, the UK has an obsession of writing future stories about healthcare at the moment, so I wouldn't go for Pause. that. <laughs> because the healthcare system's in a bit of trouble. Exactly. Um, but is, is there some particular context in the world, um, could be a company, could be a government, could be a nation, where you think actually there's a group of people who have probably have a story that's worth telling? I, well, with that, with that final piece, I think there's, there's probably two areas. One is, kind of going back to what I was just talking about, finding um, finding the untold stories about futures that from populations who haven't gotten the, haven't been given the ability or the access or the tools to tell those stories. Um, you know, it's up till now we've been speaking a lot about in, in Western civilization, you know, it's, it's my story. It's effectively a kind of, you know, white male of a certain age and, and income and access and privilege being able to kind of talk a lot about <laughs> what futures we think are, are appropriate. I think there's a lot of other directions that we can tell the story from. 
I guess if you ask if you asked me, uh, um, I would probably say so. In, it, to further refine that answer, actually, I would probably ask, and I've seen some the beginnings of some projects that are doing this in Canada. But I would probably ask uh, First Nations populations in Canada. Um, not a lot of foresight work is being done in that area, and and in fact, it's an area where there needs to be a lot of uh, there needs to be more planning. That we need to be more mindful um, and stuff. So I think like I would focus on 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 that just as like if you ask me like one target area, it's like oh this yes, um, and in fact, some of my students at Oakhead University just wrapped up a project on the future of. Uh, of mining and the future of, of resource management among those populations and public-private partnerships and all kinds of interesting stuff. And it really gave me this 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 deeper interest in it than I already had. So that's sort of one of the things that's top of mind uh, right now. Um, I bet though there's also a fun answer, which is um, yes. space. Yeah, no, the final frontier. Um, Would you like to write about a story about space with, given that the space narratives have been, have come from a very small Population in the world. You're so pointing at me to answer. You're pointing at me that you want to write a story it's with me. me. It's you. Um, no, I, I think choose you, Pikachu. <laughs> <laughs> I think in this, you know, if we're looking at it from a cultural point of view, you know, we're we kind of grew up in diff slightly different ages in the or slightly different points in the kind of you know the Apollo uh, era when when there was a different kind of way of thinking about this epic you know, journey, uh, this epic sort of possibility. Now we're seeing some things be so incredibly tangible. Yeah. And countries are talking about not just that they're going to build a spaceport, but how and where and what it's going to look like and what's going to happen inside. We frankly haven't stopped to consider a lot of the small details, a lot of the day-to-day -day mundane issues that go along with space travel and how that actually is affected by different cultures. Yeah. Um, we've only had one story told so far, and that's, you know, government-based... Um, space travel of a certain type. I think there's so much out there, so many variations, that that's another interesting area that's got a lot of uh, appeal to it. Uh, yeah, I was going to add that I had, I have, there may in fact be a story about space coming out sometime in the next month that addresses some of those similar concerns. So it's not a setup. That I will, uh, uh, that, that if you follow us on Twitter, you will eventually find out about. <laughs> um, thank you. <laughs> Your publisher will be very happy that you. Had oh, it's a, it's a yeah. The the agency will be very happy eventually. Um, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, um, for those yeah, I guess I should plug books. There are some books over there if people want them. Uh, Madeline, Madeline is a great writer, as I know, and I'm, please have a look at her books over there. We're we're well. You can over take time. them. Please don't make me fly with them back again. <laughs> yes, they're not sold in Dubai, so we're very lucky to have them here. Um, <laughs> On that note, please join me in thanking Scott and Madeline for a great discussion this lunchtime. Hopefully we'll see you all again soon. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for having us.